um, there was a short little audio recording talking about the mushrooms, and then you might remember ran into some problems. My mouse wasn't working. Looks like I'm still having mouse problems. Well, sugar. Um, hmm, okay. Sure like to get rid of that little puppy. Okay, so you guys, so um, we talked about how the stipe of the mushroom was made up of well-organized hyphae packed together, and the cap was a structure for making basidiospores. And since mushrooms make basidiospores, they're classified as basidiomycetes or basidiomycota. So again, the, these are these are these are just like lab exam questions, you guys. So um, we wanted you to to draw a mushroom and label the stipe and the cap, and the stipe and the cap are made out of hyphae. Um, the gills are um, the structures upon which the basidia are formed, the little clubs, and then the basidia make the basidia spores. And the basidia spores, you guys, are um, a product of sexual reproduction. So there's two different parents, genetically unique parents. They combine their genetic information. So the basidia spores are genetically unique. They'll drop down um, when when the um, basidia spores are mature. They'll drop down, and then air currents will blow them far, far away from the parent. And this is good because the parent doesn't want all of its offspring competing for the same food supplies. So the basidiospores are genetically unique and they'll be blown to new food sources, new little ecosystems. And then the next question you guys, what part of the fungus grows beneath the soil? So beneath the soil there are hyphae called vegetative hyphae. And the job of the vegetative hyphae is to release the digestive enzymes, um, hydrolytic enzymes, start breaking down food outside of the fungal cells and then they're going to absorb the smaller nutrient molecules across the cell membrane. So the, it, the vegetative hyphae, they're almost the equivalent of plant roots, right? But again, they're going to be absorbing the nutrients. And then which division or class, you guys, because the fungi make basidiospores, they're basidiomycetes. Good. And folks, on our lab exam, we aren't going to do morels. Morels are fleshy fungi, but we're not going to do them. They're ascomycetes. So on the lab exam, you guys don't worry about morels. They're good to eat. So you guys, next we're going to move to a filamentous um, fu fungus where the hyphae aren't well organized. So this is ry rhizopus, also known as bread mold. And um, we'll have cultures of rhizopus growing on auger plates. But you might see something similar like this, maybe growing on, for example, old bread in your kitchen. So these white little threads, these little filaments that we're seeing here growing up into the air, those are called aerial hyphae. They're growing up into the air. And the purpose of aerial hyphae is, is to support spore-producing structures. Now, usually, you guys, hyphae are white. They're colorless, so they look like little white threads. When you start seeing color appear, it's like watch out because the color is telling you the spores are being made and the spores are usually colored. Um, often when the spores are made, or sometimes when the spores are made, sometimes the aerial hyphae will start to color. But here, just as we'll see on our rhizopus cultures, these little dot, dot, dots, these are the collections of dark colored spores in these little sacs called sporangia. So a single one is called a sporangium. And the spores that are made inside are asexual, means there's only a single parent. And because they're made in a sporangium, they're called sporangiospores. Okay, and this is, again, you guys, where the vocabulary gets really tough in mycology. Now, you'll see on some of these diagrams, the aerial hyphae that's supporting the sporangium, it'll have a very specific name. So here it's called a sporangiophore. Don't worry about it. All you need to, wor all, all you need to worry about is to know that these hyphae growing up into the air are the aerial hyphae, and their job is to support spore-producing structures. Okay, so vegetative hyphae, let's go through the list here, you guys. So vegetative hyphae, they're growing down into the food, so on our auger plates, the vegetative hyphae are growing into the auger, releasing digestive enzyme, absorbing the nutrients. The aerial hyphae we've identified here, and again, you guys, don't worry about sporangiophore. I don't know why I put it here. I should have that's just going to make you worry, but don't worry about it. And then the sporangium is the little sac, and inside the sporangium are the sporangiospores. So are sporangiospores asexual spores? What do you think? 
just a single parent, so they're asexual. And, and folks, this is the only um, zygomycete you need to remember. Rhizopus is a zygomycete, and it's the only zygomycete I'll ask you on, on the lab exam. Now, why are they called zygomycetes? Well, this is one that does carry out, um, oh, sorry, got a cat rubbing on the mouse. Well, that's kind of funny. Makes sense, right? The cat's rubbing on the mouse. Okay, let me see if I can get this to work. So um, what you all are going to do, you're going to be, in, in addition to looking at the rhizopus growing on the auger plates, you're also going to be checking out a micro B box of paired slides, and you're going to look at slide 29, and this will be rhizopus undergoing or, or I should say forming asexual spores. So you're going to see rhizopus, and you'll see the little hyphae, the little filaments, and you're going to be looking for these little balls. Um, and those little balls will be the sporangia, and inside will be the sporangia spores. It, this looks almost like an upside-down balloon on a string here. Okay, But we were, we were starting in trying to figure out why the heck rhizopus is a zygomycete. It's because... Rhizopus carries out sexual reproduction, and the sexual spores they form are called zygospores. So again, in the old days, if you made zygospores, you were called a zygomycete. So hopefully you guys in your micro B boxes, let me see if I have the right, the right, in your micro B box number 30, um, this is rhizopus performing sexual reproduction. So we can think of this, you guys, it, there's two different parents, genetically different parents here, and they'll secrete um, chemical messengers called pheromones, and that lets the other mate know that there's an appropriate mate in the neighborhood. So what they'll do is they'll grow these little lateral extensions here, and when they meet here in the middle, they'll, ma they'll make what's called a zygosporangium, or you could call it a zygospore, either one's fine on the lab exam. And that zygospore is a spore made from sexual reproduction. So the zygospore has a unique combination of genes from both of the parents, we could say from both mom and dad. And the zygospores, you guys, are awesome on your slides. They're big, they're bumpy. You can see both the parents coming in here, right? So we know it's a product of sexual reproduction. So since Rhizopus makes um, zygospores. It's classified as a zygomycete. And this is a cool picture, you guys. You have the asexual sporangia here, and then you have the really cool, dark, bumpy um, zygospores, sexual spores here. The next filamentous mold you guys we're going to take a look at is penicillium. And remember, this is the fungus that makes the beta-lactam antibiotic discovered by um, Alexander Fleming penicillin. So we'll have some plates. And you guys, I've read that hopefully our penicillium colonies will have these little droplets. My understanding is these droplets are chock full of penicillin. It'd be kind of cool if we could harvest some of those droplets and then use them in antibiotic sensitivity testing. Okay, so you guys, so um, in some ways penicillium is similar to rhizopus. So let's go down here to this little diagram. They'll have these aerial hyphae um, that will support spore producing structures. But you can see here that these asexual spores produced by penicillin, it's different. They're not held within a sac. We see the aerial hyphae splitting. It's almost like little fingers here. And then at the tip of the fingers, the little asexual spores called conidia spores or conidia will be formed, right? So all this, this kind of turquoise color here, folks, those are the conidia. It, it, they're powdery. If you open the plate, they become airborne. You inhale them. Um, and some people are allergic, so we try not to open those plates, okay? So again, the conidia are asexual spores. And your slides, you guys, aren't that great. Um, so kind of nice to have a, uh, uh, this is a stained photomicrograph. So here's the aerial hyphae, you guys. Here are the little fingers, the branching here. You do not need to remember phyllids. You don't have to remember that. But do remember, you guys, these little asexual spores up here are called conidia. Now, in the old days, penicillium was part of that um, fungi imperfecti. Um, I think eventually they did found, find sexual reproduction in penicillium, um, but using, um, using DNA sequencing, it was verified that penicillium belonged to the, remember the def default group, you guys? 
penicillium is an ascomycete. When in doubt, say ascomycete, and nine times out of ten, you'll be right. The next little guy we're going to take a look at, you guys, are unicellular fungi, so-called yeasts. You're going to be looking at Saccharomyces cerevisiae, micro B box 27. And in addition, you guys will have some um, Saccharomyces alive culture. We'll add some warm water and some sugar, and we'll get the Saccharomyces um, undergoing the same type of asexual reproduction right here. Well, we can make wet mounts and see this cool asexual reproduction called budding. And budding, if you want to describe it in a fancy way, it's a, an asymmetric cytokinesis. Cytokinesis is when a cell divides in two. So usually we think of a cell it gets bigger and divides into equal parts. But this doesn't happen with Saccharomyces. What it does instead, it gets bigger and then it doesn't divide equally. It will, um, when it divides, one, one of the like daughter cells will be smaller than the other cell. And when this little daughter cell is still attached to, the, to the, this larger partner, it's referred to as a bud. And budding, you guys, is classic for yeasts. So one year, our son had a really bad sore throat, so I took a throat swab and, and gram stained it in our lab, and I saw these budding, budding, big budding cells, and I know, aha, it's a yeast, so I knew it was Candida albicans. So it is kind of cool. The budding lets you know very often that you're looking at a yeast. So um, for our lab exam, you guys, you only need to know the asexual reproduction of Saccharomyces, um, via budding. Um, previous, oh that's a cool bud, look at that, that's a really cool one. Okay, previously we also had you identify the sexual spores of Saccharomyces and they are ascospores, but just forget this you guys, We I threw it out. I, I just felt like you guys were getting overwhelmed. So you will not need to know the ascospores, the sexual spores of Saccharomyces. Okay, they're kind of cool, but you don't, you won't need this for the lab exam, but do remember that Saccharomyces, they are ascomyces. Okay, you guys, and this is going into day two, symbiotic um, fungi, but let me see if I can't get this done, you guys, because I am running behind doing recordings. So day two, you guys, will be symbiotic fungi. We're first going to look at fungi involved in what we call mutualism. So we'll have some cool lichens for you. And folks, lichens are sim symbiotic relationships between fungi and a photosynthetic partner. And the photosynthetic partner can either be an algae or cyanobacteria. And our, our previous emeritus A&P instructor, Dr. Phil Coleman, used to be, a, I think, like a ranger in a park. And so he was um, educating the public. And so he had this cool little saying, um, to help people remember what lichens were, he, he, and it goes like this, if I can remember it properly, Alice Algae took a lichen, lichen, to Freddy Fungus. So remember, lichens are symbi symbiotic relationships between fungus and either algae or cyanobacteria. And they're gorgeous, you guys. You do not have to remember folios, fruticos, or crustos, but we will have some examples of the, of some of the incredible varieties of lichens. So remember, it's win-win. Um, the um, fungi help anchor the photosynthetic partner to a surface out in nature. So it could be like a tree or a branch or a rock. Um, and will help with water and mineral absorption. Now, what does the um, cyanobacteria or algae do? They carry out oxygenic photosynthesis. They take CO2 and water and make um, organic molecules like glucose and they release um, oxygen. And so what the photosynthetic partner do is feeding the fungus glucose, right? Remember that the, fun the fungi are chemoheterotrophs. They require preformed organic molecules as a source of energy and carbon. In the first um, video, I misspoke. I said the um, fungi is chemoheterotrophs require preformed organic molecules as food and carbon. Anyway. <laughs> They need preformed organic molecules as a source of um, energy and carbon. So hopefully, you guys, if we have some fresh lichen, we'll make a lichen shake, which is really cool. We just take the lichen and we blend it with some water, and then we make a wet mount. And hopefully, we'll be able to see, it probably won't be this nice, but hopefully, we'll be able to see some um, filamentous fungal hyphae. And then we'll be able to see some green, round, either algal or cyanobacteria cells. So you won't need to, to know this um, 
structure of the lichen, just know that the two symbiotic partners there are working together, helping one another. And this is just another cartoon, you guys, of how the lichen. Um, here's our our um, fungal hyphae here, and here's our photosynthetic partner there. I got a little carried away, didn't I? But very cool. And again, you guys, you won't need to know any of the details of the organization here. And then, folks, in the micro bee box slides 51 through 54, we're going to look at a symbiotic relationship between fungi and plants, specifically plant roots. And this symbiosis is called mycorrhiza, um, literally um, root, fungus root. And, folks, there's two different types of mycorrhiza, ecto and endomycorrhiza. The only one I'm going to ask you about on our lab exam is ectomycorrhiza. And ectomycorrhiza is when the fungi live outside of the plant cells, outside of the plant cells. Um, in contrast, you guys, in endomycorrhiza, the fungi penetrate the plant cell wall. So they make cellulase, right, to digest the, the cellulose. And then the fungi grows between the plant cell wall and the plant cytoplasmic membrane. Thus, it's called endo. Again, you guys, we're only going to focus on ectomycorrhiza. And again, in ectomycorrhiza, the fungi, although they can penetrate into the plant root itself, they do not, they do not digest the plant cell wall. They don't live um, between the plant cell wall and the cytoplasmic membrane. They remain outside of the cell. And this little stain section here, you guys, this is, these are similar, I'm, well, I hope they're similar to what you'll see in your micro bee boxes. So this is the um, cross section of the plant cell. And then these little filaments right here, this is the fungal partner. So just so you know, you guys, I'll always tell you, okay, this specimen is a plant root, and I'll have the pointer on these little filaments. And so I'll ask you which organism um, made these filaments, and you want to say fungi. And so you have fungi living um, on the plant root. So we know this is an ectomycorrhiza. The plant is a photoautotroph. It's going to make... Um, glucose um, is it's carrying out photosynthesis above the ground with its leaves, and then it transport, transports the glucose down to the roots and feeds it to the fungi. And what are the fungi doing? This is so cool. So they have so much surface area, they're going to increase water absorption and mineral absorption, and then they're going to they're give that to the plant. So it's really win-win. So cool. This one, you guys, this is um, a fungal parasite of plants. This is Claviceps purpurea. It loves to grow on grain, and when the spores land on the grain, they germinate, and basically the fungus just eats the whole um, head of uh, um, the head of the grain, um, and replaces the grain with. This is all fungal components here, and what's wild, you guys, is that Claviceps purpurea it makes a toxin called ergotamine. There's actually multiple molecules in there, but we'll just call it ergotamine. And ergotamine, you'll see in lab, looks amazingly like LSD. So the problem is if people um, harvest the grain with these ergots or sclerotia, right, that are chock full of this ergotamine, this LSD-like substance, and then grind the grain, make flour, and then use the flour to, say, make bread, the ergotamine is heat-stable, so the ergotamine isn't um, inactivated. So if people eat the flour that has ergotamine in it, horrible things happen. They have LSD-like hallucinations um, and often bad trips, like bad trips like they think they can fly, so they jump off a cliff, right? Um, or they think they're fish and they can swim, so they'll jump in a lake or in a well, and they can't swim, so they, they um, die. Um, and indeed, you guys, <laughs> this is my thought, the tale of... Um, young King Arthur and Merlin, and the story is, is that Merlin would change the young King, Arthur, young King Arthur before he was king into birds or into fish. Well, my gosh, that sounds like ergot poisoning to me. Um, so who knows where the tales of, of Merlin and the young King Arthur came from. Maybe it was a, a bad ergot trip. And it's even worse than that, is if that's not bad enough, because the, um, the ergotamine can cause blood vessels to contract, and that can lead to vasoconstriction and necrosis, right? Necrotic tissue, the tissue starts to die. And if a woman is pregnant, the ergotamine will cause um, the smooth muscles of the uterus to contract, so it can cause spontaneous miscarriage, right? 
There's even belief, you guys, that the Salem witch trials, that the young teenage girls, kind of the ultimate mean girls, were accusing their neighbors of being witches. And back in the day, what happened to witches? They were burnt, right? Horrible way to die. Um, some historians believe that those young girls were suffering with ergot poisoning, right? And they were actually hallucinating, thinking that their neighbors were witches. Now, in your micro bee box, what you're going to see, this is a little complicated. Okay, out in nature, these sclerotia or ergot would fall to the ground, and then we'd see them germinating, sprouting. And this is looking a lot like aerial hyphae, and then we're going to have a spore-producing structure up here, you guys. So that's what we're going to be looking at in our, our micro bee boxes. And again, you guys, in some ways, it's this, this little um, um, head up here is a little bit like a mushroom because its job is to make sexual spores. Now, these are ascospores, so Clavicep is an ascomycetes, but these ascospores are gonna be formed in these little teardrop spaces, and when they're mature, I wonder if we have a picture here, um, the ascospores will be released through this little hole, oops, this little hole, and then they'll be blown away to land on new grain and start the cycle all over again, right? Isn't that crazy? And again, you guys, hopefully this is something that you'll be seeing. So this is that little head we were talking about. These are these little spaces in which the asci will form the ascospores. Oh, here, here's, here was the picture, you guys, right here, sorry. So here they caught the release of the ascospores right there. Isn't that cool? Okay. So, um, and this is vocabulary you guys don't need to... To worry about. So these little spaces are called the parathesia, and there's these long slender sacs, the asci inside, and it's within the asci the ascospores are made. Okay. And oh, this is um this is is Im still important, you guys. Um, so if animals are fed um moldy grain, and a lot of times animals are fed moldy grain, because for some reason we think animals are more resilient to food poisoning, but it can cause the animals, like cattle, if you feed cattle moldy grain and it has claviceps, it'll, the poor cattle, it'll cause their hooves to slough off, their tails to slough off, and again, that's from the vasoconstriction, the necrosis. It's really not good. Um, tiny amounts of ergotamine have been used to help treat migraines, to induce labor, to help control hemorrhage, so I guess the poison is in the dose, right? Kind of fascinating. Candida albicans, you guys, this is an opportunistic pathogen. It can act as a commensal, or if given the opportunity, it can overgrow and cause really painful inflammation, and in really immunocompromised folks can actually invade the bloodstream. So your prepared slides, you guys, where are the prepared slides? Oh, sugar. Oh, you guys, so sorry. All on the board, we'll have to put which... Um, um, B box slide you'll be looking at for candida albicans, but note you guys what you really want to take notice of they are budding right so classical yeast budding and again they're going to be opportunistic pathogens um, often your patients will develop candidiasis following broad spectrum antibiotic use and the reason is you kill all the good competing bacteria antibiotics won't kill the candida and so they just have a party they start growing like crazy so we can have vaginal yeast infections, very painful. Um, we can have oral infections, oral candidiasis called thrush, and you'll see this kind of thick, kind of creamy layer inside the mouth. And we can have anal rectal candidiasis. This can happen in babies as, as a form of diaper rash, but it can also happen in adults, and it's very painful. And, oh, and you guys also with oral thrush, it can cause a horrible, horrible sore throat. And then another, um, another fungus that is a parasite are the so-called dermatophytes. Um, these are fungi that invade keratinized tissue. And keratin, you guys, it's, it provides strength to our skin, our nails, and our hair. And usually microbes can't can't digest hydrolyzed keratin, but this group of fungi, the trichophyte and epidermophyte and microsporum, they make keratinase, so they actually eat the keratin. So they can cause infections of the skin, um, classically called ringworm, because in the old days people actually thought it was a worm in there, but it's fungal. Um, I've had this, you guys, it can invade your nails, um, and, and it's a great thing to throw around at a party called it can cause onychomycosis, but you don't have to remember that. 
um, this is just a, 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 a stain smear of, of, of um, I think, I can't read it, you guys. I'm guessing that might be trichophyton. You do not need to remember these genus names. Um, they'll probably be, if, if you're going to see them, they would be bonus questions, right? Um, but what is really important, you guys, is how do people get infected, right? So obviously, if you come into contact with an infected person, the, the um, dermatophyte can be transferred. But sometimes, you guys, the, the dermatophytes are in the soil. I think the reason I ended up with the nail infection was I was cutting my nails really deep, like too deep here. And then I'd go out and hike or work in the garden, and I ground dirt into the um, the area around the nail and I think that's how I, I inoculated myself so this is a big problem like folks who um, who can't you know maybe they're in really harsh conditions you know people that are hiking for hundreds of miles or folks in the military sometimes they, they they're in maybe a war situation they can't take good care of their feet so this would be a, um, a problem and then another source you guys are animals um, non-human animals um, a lot of the dermatophytes are zoonotic. So if you have, if you have like a little kid that presents with this, you'd want to ask the parents, have you recently adopted a kitten or a puppy? Because that's a really a real common way, especially for little kids that get infected, is they have contact with a, a kitten or a dog um, who has a dermatophyte infection. So here we can see when the um, fungi live in the hair. Um, in, in our hydrolyzing the keratin, the hair falls off, so you get, this is called alopecia, right, so from the dermatophytes, and here's a little puppy that also has alopecia from a dermatophyte infection, so again, you guys, little kids, um, often if they come in contact with a puppy or kitten with dermatophytes, then they end up getting infected, so you always want to ask about what animals the kids have been around. Now, you guys, that's the end of the worksheet, but in class, we are going to talk about two really important fungal pathogens that cause systemic infections. These are superficial infections, the candida and dermatophytes. We're going to be talking about coccidioides imidis, which causes San Joaquin Valley fever, really important for us to know here in Sacramento. And then as a bonus, we'll be talking about Cryptococcus neoformans. Um, and unfortunately, you guys, Cryptococcus neoformans, it... Um, Usually we think of it as being an opportunistic pathogen. Usually folks with strong immune systems don't get infected, but if you have immunocompromised patients, like folks that have moved from just HIV into AIDS, they're going to be at high risk. Maybe your um, patient's undergoing cancer therapy. So we inhale the spores, and they germinate in the lungs, and then they can spread everywhere, especially to the brain. And again, in immunocompromised folks, this is really hard to treat. Um, and then we'll talk about a new, more highly virulent Cryptococcus, Cryptococcus gatii that's invaded the west coast of North America, and that's far more virulent. Um, the Cryptococcus neoformans is associated with pigeon feces or bird feces, so that can be a challenge if you have a really severely immunocompromised patient and they like to keep birds or they like to be with pigeons, that can be an issue. It's another reason why hospitals don't want birds or pigeons roosting near their air vents because they, they don't want the, the air um, being taken into the hospital to be contaminated with Cryptococcus neoformans. And we will do a little bit more on coccidioides imidis, you guys, in, um, in lecture. And I'll see if I can't get a couple of handouts for you. Okay, I think that's enough. That was so long. Apologies. But at least we got through both fungal labs with this. Okay. Let me see what I can do here. Okay, you guys.